interim report by the vice chair and we interact with the OSCE governmental officials relevant to the mandate of this first committee. For this meeting, we have invited the chair of the OSCE security Com committee, Ambassador Dacan Ildem of Turkey. Hartley, welcome to you. Thank you very much that you came to us. Yeah, yeah, you can give a small applause to that. Why, why not? Thank you. We have also invited a panel of experts on fighting terrorism and crime. We will hear from Mauro Miedico, who represents the Terrorism Prevention Branch of the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime. In addition, from the OSCE, we have invited three experts from three different units, which have all recently been integrated into new transnational threats unit. Marion, Manuel Marion from the Transnational National Threats Action Against Terrorism Unit. Murat Yildiz from the Transnational Threats Strategy Pol Police, Police Matters Unit. And Nemanja Malisevic, the Cyber Security Officer. After these keynote presentations, we will have a debate. May I inform you, if you want to take the floor at any point, please register in advance with the staff here at the podium to my left. I urge you to sign up as soon as possible for the debate on fighting terrorism and crime, since we'll have to calculate the time based on interest. I might have to close the list at some point, so please sign up early. Before we move into today's agenda, I would like to start by introducing and thanking the committee's rapporteur, Vilja Alkenaita Abramikiena from Lithuania, who is sitting one, two, three, left to me, who was elected on this position for the first time in our meeting in Belgrade. We will be hearing her ideas for for the annual report and draft resolution a little later. I would also like to introduce and thank Vice Chair Ms. Susan Bradley from Norway, who was elect, also elected in Belgrade. In accordance with our rules, the Vice Chair will present a preliminary report on follow-up on the recommendations we made at the annual session in Belgrade. Let me remind you that the theme for the 2012 annual session is the OSCE Region of Change. Now we come to the presentation by Vilja, Rapporteur for the First General Committee on her ideas. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, really very good being able in my age to do something still the first time. Uh, dear Chairman, Excellencies, dear colleagues, the theme we have picked, Region of Change, embodies the very essence of OECE. Since the founding of the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the security environment in the region has changed radically. OECEPA itself was established in the era of positive changes when Eastern and Central Europe decisively refused dependency and totalitarianism. In recent years, a number of, a new, of new security challenges have emerged. The organization must continue developing its identity at the political level by linking its activities with new multidimensional threats to security, both in the OECE region and neighboring areas. Moreover, while strengthening our activities and focusing on the security field, human rights and democracy cannot be compromised. It's with great regret that a number of participating states have stepped back from this fundamental principle of comprehensive security during the Vilnius OECE ministerial meeting last December. 
Over the last decade, the notion of change has acquired not only positive connotation. When we speak about the regions of tension and conflicts, it often requires enormous efforts by our organization and international community to prevent bad becoming even worse. And we should admit the positive fact that in 2011, in the OECE area, no new conflicts emerged. The unresolved and protracted conflicts which still exist in the OECE region remain one of the greatest threats to security and stability. These conflicts have, for too long, caused human lives, forced large population groups to live as refugees or IDPs, and at the same time taken up a large portion of a country's human and financial resources. It's my pleasure to note that in 2011, notable progress was made with the formal resumption of the 5 plus 2 talks in the Transnistrian settlement process in Vilnius. It is, now, it is now of paramount importance that the parties involved continue the work and negotiations in earnest. And I hope that the next official 5 plus 2 meeting in Dublin will be fruitful. We were informed at our fall meetings in Dubrovnik that, regrettably, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict continues to cost lives along the line of contact and that tensions in this region are still extremely high. The co-chairs of the Minsk group, together with the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan, are working on developing a plan for peace. And it is now mainly up to these parties to work intensively to resolve the conflict and sign an agreement. An important first step is to ensure that the ceasefire agreement is being respected and that snipers be withdrawn. It's also vital that full investigations are conducted when conflict-related incidents occur. The joint statement by the Minsk Group or co-chair countries and the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan issued in Vilnius reaffirmed the importance of reaching a peaceful settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. In Georgia, the Geneva international discussions continue to serve as a valuable contribution. Although any movement towards a solution will be difficult. However, it is encouraging that in 2011, a number of OECE-sponsored confidence-building projects have been approved and implemented. The parties should continue to move forward and seek confidence-building to overcome not only the security-related challenges, but also the acute humanitarian consequences of the 2008 war. In this respect, OECEPA encourages the relevant parties to positively consider the latest proposals by the pre previous chairmanship. This would enable the OECE to reopen a meaningful presence in Georgia and to cover all three dimensions of the OECE's work. The OCE proved its value again in assisting states that experienced ethnic violence. Though belatedly, the OCE participating states deployed the Community Security Initiative in Kyrgyzstan. I hope the OCE EPA will continue to lobby for the success of the OCE and chairmanship activities in Kyrgyzstan. As stated in the Astana Commemorative Declaration, conventional arms control and confidence in security building regimes remain major instruments for ensuring military stability, predictability, and transparency, 
and should be revitalized, updated, and modernized. In our Belgrade Declaration, the Assembly also adopted a recommendation stemming from this committee urging for an updated Vienna document, a further elaboration of the Code of Conduct on political military aspects of security, and an increased effort to start negotiations on the strengthening and modernizing of conventional arms control in Europe. Some progress was made with the adoption of nine so-called Vienna Plus decisions taken during the Ministerial Council meeting in Vilnius, which led to a reissue of the Vienna document in 2011. From now on, the Vienna document will be updated every five years to better reflect the constantly changing political military realities. However, the merely technical and procedural decisions made in November fall far too short of the expectations we had for a general strategic update of the Vienna document. It's clearly less ambitious uh, as it was expected. There is a strong need uh, for participating states to make use of the Forum for Security Cooperation to achieve concrete results in areas such as lowering the thresholds at which participating states are obliged to inform each other of military exercises increasing the opportunities for verification activity, modernizing and updating the exchange of military information, strengthening risk reduction mechanisms, and enlarging the scope of confidence and security building measures. Now, more than ever, it's of crucial importance to modernize the Vienna document in a more strategic, forward-looking way since the CFE modernization process was blocked last year by one country. We should be able to set aside our national agendas to engage on work that would benefit us all. I cannot avoid mentioning that the year 2012 started on an, on an unfortunate note. The same one country's refusal of Spanish and Swedish Vienna document evaluation visits on the grounds of force majeure, based on a lack of internal regulations, is unacceptable and undermines the object and purpose of the document. It is believed that this is merely a technical issue which will be resolved. The OECE, due to its broad membership and comprehensive approach to security, offers a unique platform to discuss new threats, including cyber threats. The OECE's expertise regarding CBMs could be usefully applied in cyberspace to enhance transparency, predictability, stability, and reduce the risks of misperception, escalation, and conflict. Such CBMs would also allow for an exchange of national views on the norms of behavior within political military contexts, thus building on existing international law. The OEC should complement existing efforts and actively cooperate with other regional and international entities active in this thematic area. Of course, much work has been done during the year 2011 to explore the future role of the OEC in this context, and the work should continue. With the Arab Spring of 2011, we hope that several of the OEC's Mediterranean partners would further approach the core values of the OEC, giving new possibilities for development in the region. 
At the same time, the uprisings and war in Libya, increasing violence in Syria, and international diplomatic confrontation over it challenged the perception of security in a large portion of the OECE region. It's obvious how much security in the OECE area is indivisibly linked to the stability and security of the neighboring regions. Middle East, the South Mediterranean, Afghanistan, and Asia. In the wake of events in the South Mediterranean, the OECE institutions and the chairmanship have been actively involved in a dialogue with the Mediterranean partners, offering concrete proposals in the areas of democratic practices, media freedom, rule of law, and police reform. A decision on, on strengthening cooperation with the OECE partners was adopted in the Vilnius Ministerial Council. The OEC can and should play a more active role in facilitating cooperation between Afghanistan and the participating states from Central Asia in addressing the security challenges the region is facing, especially in light of the planned withdrawal of the ISAF from Afghanistan. The decision on strengthening the OEC engagement with Afghanistan should serve this purpose. Developing an enhanced arms control regime and increasing the level of cooperation with neighboring regions would also increase the OEC's ability to, to contribute to the international fight against terrorism. The OEC's efforts in border monitoring and police training are important in this work However, it's crucial to keep strengthening early warning capabilities as well as to develop fast reaction mechanisms to prevent and respond to extremism, radicalization, or the upsurge of different kinds of violence. In this context, the adoption of the decision on the strengthening of the OECE capacities in the conflict cycle must be welcome. Do I, do I have time left? Within the comprehensive understanding of security, the fight against terrorism cannot be dealt with, for, with from a hard security standpoint on, only. Human rights and human dignity must be addressed also. The OEC should initiate the development of a comprehensive consolidated policy together with international partners to counter terrorism and its causes. Dear colleagues, the global political community nowadays has to operate in a fast-changing environment and to fend new arising challenges. The current global financial crisis has not only hit the financial and business sectors, but has also affected most OECE participating states and their populations. This has led to social and political uncertainty, unrest, and a growing concern over a lack of security. From an institutional perspective, the cuts in national budgets have had direct consequences for the OEC. Frankly speaking, we must learn to do more with less. Maximum efficiency must be our goal. A good example of such ability is the creation of TNT department under the office of the Secretary General the institution which would provide for more strategic and higher profile engagement on TNT issues. However, we must admit that cuts of national budgets make the activities of OECE more difficult. When it comes to extra budgetary contributions, secondment of personnel, and national contributions to the ODIR selection of observations. Extra funding is crucial for OECE field missions, 
in order to hire sufficient number of staff. The field is where the bulk of the project work is carried out and also where the OEC makes a real difference. Broad and complex concept of security which we apply in our organization reminds us of everyday survival hardships that people in many regions incur due to the financial and economic crisis. As parliamentarians, we know that economic shortfalls, necessity to apply measures aimed at consolidating public finances, unemployment and similar problems create tension within societies. Therefore, we must be extremely prudent to keep the tendencies of radicalism from gaining force and to oblige even stronger to promote and defend democratic values. Dear colleagues, with this report I wasn't aiming at broad generalization. Therefore, I will listen closely to your discussions, your comments, and I'm sure that your insight uh, will contribute to my preparation for the annual session. Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much, Vilia. You did a great job. Thank you for that speech. So we have two friends registered to comment. Number one is Mr. Michel Biou from France. Oui, Monsieur le Président, mes chers collègues, euh, Madame le rapporteur nous a effectivement présenté des éléments très riches, très complets. J'ai cependant noté qu'elle n'abordait pas la question du futur traité régulant le commerce et le transfert des armes classiques. Sans doute parce que demain il y aura un débat spécial sur cette question, mais il me semble peut-être important qu'elle soit posée aujourd'hui puisque ça intéresse au premier chef notre commission. Voilà déjà plusieurs années que l'idée d'élaborer un tel traité a germé. Je veux d'ailleurs saluer le travail acharné mené par les ONG dans ce domaine qui a peu à peu permis à la communauté internationale de prendre la mesure de la nécessité d'un tel instrument. C'est aussi grâce à elle que se pourra s'ouvrir dans quelques mois la conférence des Nations Unies. Nous sommes donc dans la dernière ligne droite. Les États ont défini la semaine dernière, non sans mal, le règlement intérieur censé régir les négociations finales, mais celle-ci devrait être encore âpre en juillet prochain. Je crois néanmoins que l'actualité internationale des derniers mois impose de conclure rapidement les négociations. La répression sanglante organisée par les dirigeants des pays de la rive sud de la Méditerranée à l'encontre des manifestants pacifistes du printemps arabe n'aurait pas été possible s'ils n'avaient pu acheter des armes. L'enjeu de ce traité est donc fondamental à l'heure où certains États membres du Conseil de sécurité poursuivent leur transfert d'armes vers des pays où l'on sait parfaitement que leur utilisation est détournée à l'encontre des populations civiles. Il faut donc un traité ambitieux pour qu'il soit efficace, faute de quoi nous ne parviendrons pas à limiter les violations des droits de l'homme auxquelles nous assistons quotidiennement. Qui dit traité ambitieux dit forcément adoption de normes ambitieuses. J'en identifie trois. Premièrement, le champ d'application. Il doit être le plus large possible pour couvrir à la fois toutes les armes classiques, les munitions comme les équipements de maintien de l'ordre et de police. Le traité doit par ailleurs couvrir non seulement la vente d'armes, mais également le transfert de la propriété des armes ou le transfert de leur contrôle. Deuxièmement, il faut s'assurer que le transfert sera interdit dès lors qu'il existe un risque substantiel que les armes soient utilisées pour commettre ou faciliter de graves violations du droit international. Troisièmement, le traité devra mettre en place des obligations de transparence. À ce titre, il me paraîtrait important d'imposer aux États de publier des rapports publics pour que les obligations mises en place par le traité n'en restent pas au stade de vœux pieux. J'espère qu'une minorité d'États ne sera pas en mesure de faire obstacle au cours de la négociation à l'introduction de ces trois éléments. À ce titre, je dois avouer qu'il me paraît dommage que le principe du consensus ait été retenu pour les questions de fond. Quoi qu'il en soit, nous restons à la veille d'un événement historique et à mon sens, il pourrait être intéressant 
que le rapport qui sera présenté à Monaco évoque cette question. En effet, puisque nous le recevons quelques semaines à l'avance, il nous fournira l'occasion de débattre et de rapprocher nos positions à la veille de la conférence, tout en nous laissant la possibilité de convaincre nos gouvernements de l'enjeu fondamental que constitue l'adoption d'un tel traité. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you. Next one is Monsieur Gatetto from Monaco. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, je, je voudrais féliciter notre collègue Vilia de Lituanie pour euh, la présentation qu'elle nous a faite et à laquelle j'adhère, bien sûr. Euh, C'est un panorama très complet euh, et, et donc très intéressant. J'ai noté dans le cours de sa présentation quelques propos concernant le printemps arabe. Et euh, à mon sens, euh, le, le thème de la conférence étant euh, l'OSCE, une région de changement, il m'apparaît que euh, ce qui s'est passé euh, au, sur la rive sud de la Méditerranée euh, a une importance euh, extrêmement grande dans euh, l'équilibre euh, de la sécurité euh, des pays de l'OSCE, puisque euh, ce sont nos voisins immédiats sur notre rive sud. Ce qui s'est passé dans les pays arabes euh, revêt une importance fondamentale parce que c'est un événement qui est aussi historique que je rapprocherai pratiquement de la chute du mur de Berlin. Euh, c'est un événement de nature à bouleverser les équilibres euh, géopolitique de la région et de la région européenne en particulier. C'est pourquoi il me semble que euh, euh, si ce rapport mentionne effectivement ce qui s'est passé dans les pays arabes, euh, nous aurions à mon sens tout euh, euh, intérêt et certainement euh, compte tenu de l'importance de, ce, de ces événements, euh, il m'apparaît légitime que les développements qui seront consacrés au printemps arabe soient un peu plus importants que ce qu'il est apparu à la lecture euh, de la présentation qui nous a été faite tout à l'heure. Un euh, une analyse un peu plus détaillée serait certainement bienvenue en analysant euh, la situation en Syrie, en Libye, en Tunisie. Euh, il y a également des mouvements qui se sont euh, faits jour et qui ont été étouffés euh, au Bahreïn, par exemple. Euh, il y a également des bouleversements constitutionnels colossaux qui ont affecté le Maroc, des élections qui doivent intervenir en, en Algérie, euh, la situation au Liban. Ce sont des, des, des domaines qui me semblent mériter quelques euh, développements, quelques analyses complémentaires qui seraient, de, à mon sens, de nature à enrichir le rapport qui sera présenté lors de la prochaine session annuelle. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much. Uh, next one is Mrs. Muradova from Azerbaijan. Спасибо, господин председатель. Госпожа докладчик в своем вступлении сказала, что она радуется тому, что за прошедший период в регионе ОБСЕ не возникли новые конфликты. Но, мы, но и мы не радуемся тому, что за прошедший период мы не смогли решить ни один конфликт, существующих в регионе. А в части конфликта в Азербайджане она в своем вступлении призывает отводу снайперов и механизма расследования инцидентов. Нам очень интересно, на основе какой информации закладчик сделал этот призыв. Хочу отметить, что с нашей делегацией Никаких неформальных или официальных контактов не было. Поэтому мы считаем такого рода призывы не учитывающими позиции всех сторон и не отражающие реальной ситуации в зоне конфликта. Спасибо. Спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I completely agree with the first speaker that the CFE treaty and everything what is related to that is of uh, paramount importance nowadays. But, uh, of course, I had no possibility to tell everything now 
the more that it's, it was not my task. Uh, and I, I hope tomorrow we will be having a good discussion about it uh, and to express all our ideas, which will be useful for the future meetings and even for the work of the OEC. Uh, what about evaluation uh, Ara of Arab Spring? Yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, dear colleague. Uh, Arab Spring is of historical importance, I agree, and uh, uh, your uh, uh, saying about the Berlin Wall uh, perhaps is, is proper. I only want to mention that consequences of uh, Arab Spring are maybe more complex and mixed than it was in case of the Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, more dramatic, more, more uh, lines of division, but nevertheless we should go forward uh, should help uh, our Mediterranean friends uh, and to involve them into our value system. Uh, the last question, uh, yes, uh, I have included uh, unresolved conflicts in my report and I intend to call on the OEC and states in conflict to redouble their efforts to solve conflicts. Uh, as you see, uh, I was absolutely impartial and, uh, uh, will, and I hope will remain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no further comments, so we now come to point four of our agenda. Presentation by the Vice Chair, Mrs. Susanne Bratley from Norway on follow-up of the Belgrade delegation. It's your floor. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to address you on the follow-up of resolutions related to this committee. This address is based on the interim report which has been made available to you prior to this meeting. The final report will be distributed ahead of the annual session in July. The topics I'll be referring to were addressed in our committee's main resolution adopted during the annual session in Belgrade in July last year but I'm certain you will also recognize them from previous meetings and resolutions. Before I continue, and although seven months have now passed, let me thank the Serbian Parliament for a well-organized annual session. To me, the time in Belgrade was also an eye-opener with respect to Serbia's steps to turn its back to difficult issues of the past and its decisive, decisive efforts towards closer European cooperation. I think we all recognize these important steps and I truly hope that you will succeed in your aspirations. To me, the fact that Serbia will have the chairmanship of the OSCE in 2015 is a clear recognition of the positive developments we have seen in this country in recent years. In this address, I have picked two of the issues addressed in the interim report. Firstly, activities beyond the OSCE area in particular related to the Arab Spring. And secondly, the need to re-establish an OSCE presence in Belarus and Georgia. Activities beyond the OSCE area, in particular related to the Arab Spring. In the Belgrade Declaration, the OSCE is encouraged to increase, upon request, the sharing of its values and experiences beyond the OSCE area. This is, of course, especially relevant in light of political change in North Africa and the Middle East. I was therefore pleased to, to see all five Mediterranean partners represented, represented during the Mediterranean Forum in Dubrovnik in October. I was also pleased to see that support has been expressed for the role of women in North African politics. I think the matter of increasing the influence of women will be crucial for the success of the Arab Spring. This was also the message from the three female Nobel Prize laureates last year, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Leima Gobovi, and Tavakal Kerman. Another follow-up was the OSCE PA's substantial contribution through its election observations mission in Tunisia. 
To me, election observation is an area where we parliamentarians can provide a direct input to the OSCE's objectives of, democ of democracy and respect for human rights. I think the OSCE and the OSCE PA should stand ready to send observers to other countries in the beyond the OSCE participating states if the countries so request. As you will see in the interim report, there are also a number of initiatives taken by the OSCE in partner states. In Belgrade, we also focused on the need to re-establish an OSCE presence in Belarus and Georgia. Regrettably, this is an area where there hasn't been any progress. There is no consensus in the OSCE to re-establish a permanent presence in these countries. Still, I think most people agree that there are few other countries where an OSCE office would be more needed. To help build democratic institutions and engage conflicting interests in meaningful di dialogue. Are there unexplored paths that we, are, that we or the OSCE could take with a view to re-establishing the two offices? I think it's important not to lose hope. It's obvious we need to find new ways to make progress in this important matter. This is only a small taste of the topics addressed in, the, in Belgrade with particular relevance to the General Committee on Political Affairs and Security. Obviously, there is much more going on than I have mentioned here. The follow-up of other important topics that you can read more about in the interim report include the Corfu process, food security, and self-sufficiency, protracted conflicts, reform of the OSCE and strengthening of arm controls. As I stated in the beginning, a more comprehensive report will be made available ahead of the annual session in Monaco. We would therefore be most grateful if you could submit inputs to the International Secretariat on your Parliament's follow-up of the Belgrade resolutions by mid-April. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. We have one comment from Mrs. Muradova of Azerbaijan. Уважаемая госпожа Таклачик, благодарю за представленный отчет. Мы принимаем его к сведению. В связи с промежуточным докладом комитета, в особенности его части, касающейся затянувшихся конфликтов, и положение Белградской декларации 2011 года хотим выразить вновь наше неприятие от имени делегации Азербайджана двойных стандартов в отношении конфликтов, существующих на территории Азербайджана, Молдовы и Грузии. Мы весьма сожалеем, что Ассамблея, несмотря на протест азербайджанской делегации, обозначила конфликт на территории Азербайджана как конфликт на Горном Карабахе. Еще раз хотим напомнить уважаемым членам Ассамблеи, что Совет Безопасности ООН в ответ на оккупацию территории Азербайджана, в том числе Нагорно-Карабахского региона и семи прилегающих к нему регионов, принял четыре резолюции, требующие незамедлительного вывода вооруженных формирований не только с Нагорно-Карабахского региона, а также с Кельбаджарского, Зангеланского, Лачинского Кубадлинского, Агдамского, Физулинского и Джебраильского регионов Азербайджанской Республики. В этой связи формулировка «конфликт» в Нагорном Карабахе, принятая в парламентской ассамблее в Белграде, идет в прямое противоречие с текстом Совета Безопасности ООН, преднамеренно ограничивает зону конфликта исключительно Нагорно-Карабахским регионам и выражает предвзятую одностороннюю позицию. Хотели бы упомянуть, что в рамках ОБСЕ данный конфликт обозначается как конфликт, которым занимается Минская группа ОБСЕ. В связи с этим азербайджанская делегация выражает свою озабоченность и указывает на недопустимость принятия ассамблеей предвзятых формулировок, которые нарушают терминологии конфликта, принятые в рамках Генассамблеи ООН, Совета безопасности ООН, ОБСЕ и других международных организаций. Мы призываем ассамблею и в частности докладчика привести название конфликта в соответствии с формулировками, принятыми в рамках вышеназванных организаций. 
В отношении части доклада, касающейся встречи Ассамблеи в Дубровнике и выступления сопредседателя Минской группы, мы очень обеспокоены тем текстом, который представлен в промежуточном докладе. Все три сопредседателя Минской группы ОБСЕ однозначно обозначили, что статус-кво в зоне конфликта неприемлем. В этой связи мы выражаем недоумение отсутствием призыва сопредседателей об изменении статуса КВО в промежуточном докладе. Нам непонятна позиция, занятая докладчиком, который проигнорировал данный призыв, прозвучавший из уст сопредседателей в Дубровнике, который также был поддержан президентом из стран сопредседателей в саммите на Довиле. Вместе этого мы обнаруживаем ссылку на прогресс Минской группы в предотвращении насилия между армянскими и азербайджанскими властями, что звучит само по себе абсурдно, ввиду чрезвычайно интенсивной динамики встреч президентов двух республик, имевших место в прошлом году при содействии российской стороны. Мы с сожалением отмечаем, что докладчик также проигнорировал не раз прозвучавшую инициативу азербайджанской делегации о содействии Ассамблеи налаживанию диалога между армянскими и азербайджанскими общинами Нагорно-Карабахского региона Азербайджана. Также отсутствует в докладе упоминание о необходимости обеспечения права возвращения в родные очаги перемещенных лиц. Эта инициатива была поддержана всем парламентариями в ходе дискуссий, кроме делегации Армении. Непонятным также является упоминание авторам промежуточного доклада, что приоритетом по мнению выступивших парламентариев является избежание войны. Данная формулировка находится в прямом противоречии с задачей сопредседателей Минской группы и выгодна лишь тем силам, которые не заинтересованы в разрешении конфликта, а пытаются всеми силами сохранить статус-кво, сохранившийся в результате оккупации территории Азербайджана. Подобный подход, уверены, не отражает намерения парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ которая принялась рассматривать ситуацию вокруг конфликта на территории Азербайджана в целях его разрешения, а не сохранения статуса КВА. Мы призываем председателя парламентской ассамблеи предотвратить подобные попытки искажения дискуссий и интерпретации выступлений, которые служат интересам сил, не заинтересованных в мирном разрешении конфликта. Надеемся, к летней сессии в Монако докладчик учтет возражения азербайджанской стороны в связи с искажениями доклада. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. Now we have Aram Safarian from Armenia. Спасибо, господин председатель. Должен сказать, что после того, как мы провели очень успешное и плодотворное обсуждение данного вопроса в Дубровнике 8 октября прошлого года, нам казалось, что мы приближаемся к разрешению конфликта Нагорного Карабаха и находим точки соприкосновения между сторонами, которые желают достичь мира. Сегодня подобная интерпретация, которая прозвучала азербайджанской стороной, не может не удивить. Всего несколько недель тому назад президенты Армении, Азербайджана, при посредничестве президента Российской Федерации в Сочи подписали заявление о следующих шагах в достижении мира и э, установлении э, более тесного диалога в направлении разрешения конфликта Нагорного Карабаха. Этими пунктами являются в том числе те, по которым госпожа Мурадова вызвала свое удивление, я имею в виду э, э, снайперов, которых следовало бы отвести, если мы желаем установить действенный контроль в зоне соприкосновения вооруженных сил в зоне конфликта. Я хочу сказать, что подобная интерпретация, которая возвращает нас к временам до 1992 года, когда определялся мандат Нагорного Карабаха и его конфликта в ОБСЕ при вступлении в него новых членов, не может не настораживать. Я думаю, что председательствующий докладчик Первого комитета, который готовит подобную резолюцию, должны непременно войти в новый контакт, в новое обсуждение с председателями Минской группы и снова попросить их комментарии в подобные 
подобных вопросах, иначе получается, что мы 18 лет говорим о чем-то, которое мы трактуем сегодня совершенно по-разному. Это удивительно и это очень огорчительно. Я думаю, если бы у нас было действительно искреннее желание в результате всех обсуждений в Дубровнике, активной деятельности Минской группы ОБСЕ прийти к какому-нибудь общему знаменателю, мы бы поступили иначе. Я призываю Первый комитет, докладчика Первого комитета продолжить усилия по э, выявлению общих точек соприкосновения между сторонами этого конфликта, послушать всех, послушать специалистов, послушать э, э, посредников и потом принять необходимое решение. Я думаю, что мы были близки к хорошему результату после Дубровника. Сегодня я сожалею, что мы так по-разному интерпретируем совершенно очевидные вещи. Спасибо вам за внимание. Most of these comments was made for the rapporteur and not for me, I think. But uh, in order to, to make this final report, which is my job, uh, I can only say that if you have inputs which would make the final report better than this one, you're welcome to send them uh, to the International Secretariat. Uh, and also I will have to say that all resolutions uh, which are already adopted are adopted this way. And my job is to follow up what's adopted by the OSCE EPA. Thank you very much. Now we come to point five of our agenda, presentation by Ambassador Tachan Ildem, Chair of the OSCE Security Committee. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairperson, the Honorable Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I am most pleased and privileged to address such a distinguished audience like this one today in my capacity as the Chairperson of the Security Committee. Some of you are, I am sure, familiar with this committee's scope, which only partially overlaps with yours. Therefore, let me shortly introduce the scope of the work carried out in this committee. It is an informal subsidiary body working under the Permanent Council, tackling mainly non-military and political aspects of security. This means transnational threats such as terrorism, organized crime, illicit drug trafficking, and cybercrime, as well issues such as police activities, border management, and so on. Since these threats are interlinked, we can address them through comprehensive, holistic responses. To counter transnational threats, OSCE's assistance to participating states in facilitating regional cooperation and capacity building in law enforcement will continue to play a pivotal role. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you some of the priorities I have put forward as the chair of the Security Committee in 2012. In our profession, communication is our primary instrument to find a way to bridge our different perceptions. To this end, I attach great importance to underlining the role of the Security Committee as the main forum for dialogue to exchange views related to the non-military aspects of security. Indeed, the Security Committee allows an exchange of views among representatives of permanent missions in Vienna to take place on TNT issues. It also allows such a dialogue between participating states and the OSC executive structures, and representatives of the Secretariat mainly address the committee regularly and share with us not only the main activities carried out in the past, but also those planned in the future. 
Secondly, I strive to set up a stage to create awareness and increase our knowledge base concerning the issues relevant to the Security Committee. In this respect, guest speakers from other international and regional organizations provide added value to our work by sparkling fruitful discussions in this venue. Many of the distinguished members of Parliament mentioned about hard economic times, and I think we need to prevent duplication and create synergies among different international organizations. In line with the objective of the new TNT Directorate, enhancing coherence and coordination among participating states, secretariat, and the chairmanship is one of our main targets. In the long perspective, I will spare no effort to further the process and take the work of the Security Committee to the next level. Since OSC itself is a process, I see this task not as a static one, but as an evolving endeavor. We will dwell on new ideas and opportunities together and hopefully reach concrete deliverables in reasonable time frame. In 2002, the priorities of the Irish chairmanship provide us the main guidance for the substance of our work in the Security Committee. The overarching goal of the chairmanship to strengthen security across all three dimensions by pursuing the full implementation by participating states of our common commitments is a major reference point. As for the Security Committee, key priorities that we will be working towards concrete progress in 2002 are, first of all, to continue our work on the four draft decisions on which consensus could not uh, be reached at the Vilnius Ministerial Council. These are related to the establishment of an informal working group to elaborate confidence-building measures in cyberspace, the strategic framework for police-related activities, consolidated framework for fight against terrorism, concept for combating the threat of illicit drugs, and diversion of chemical precursors. We have advanced text on all of these topics, which will facilitate our work to a large extent in the coming months. Second priority is to strengthen programmatic coordination among OSC executive structures. And third is to contribute in the charting of a way forward from Vilnius towards the security community identified as at the Astana summit meeting. Today, the most important development in our organization in terms of TNT is the creation of uh, the relevant department. The aim of this uh, endeavor is to increase coordination within the secretariat units while performing their tasks. This will also help us contemplate additional steps to take so that OSC can help participating states achieve the goal set by our heads of state and government in terms of TNT. That's to achieve greater unity of purpose and action. Therefore, the creation of the TNT department has been a welcome development as the outcome of the decision our ministers adopted in Vilnius on strengthening coordination and coherence in the OSC's efforts to address transnational threats. It is also endorsed by the Permanent Council with the approval of the budget at the end of last year. As a result, our organization is undergoing a timely structural transition process in this field and the appointment of the new TNT director will be an important step forward. This will no doubt facilitate our endeavors in the Security Committee and I very much look forward to this appointment. This morning when I was listening to uh, the discussion, uh, I heard Mr. Churis from Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands referring to the resolution on uh, countering violent extremism and uh, uh, radicalization that lead to terrorism uh, adopted in 2011 in Belgrade uh, meeting. And uh, I must say that uh, 
it is very much dear to our hearts uh, at the executive structure of uh, the OSCE, uh, executive branch, and uh, uh, we are intending, uh, for instance, to have a thematic meeting on this issue in the deliberations of the Security Committee in July. Now, for, finally, I would like to say a few words on our partners for cooperation, since uh, many of uh, you have already alluded to uh, the importance of Arab Spring uh, and our engagement with partners. And uh, I must say that uh, the most important, uh, one of the most important decisions of the Vilnius ministerial meeting uh, was uh, the decision on the strengthening of engagement uh, with uh, partners uh, uh, in cooperation. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, the spirit of uh, this decision, uh, we uh, thought that uh, following the rules and procedure uh, in our committee, security committee, uh, we will uh, design uh, the par uh, participation of our partners in some of the thematic meetings and our discussions for all of us uh, to benefit out of it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the global agenda regarding TNT is not static, uh, which requires us to have uh, a high level of coordination, flexibility and expertise to adapt uh, to evolving challenges on short notice. Uh, the OSC has developed in the course of the years uh, special instruments and an added value in terms of fighting uh, with transnational threats. Uh, we look forward to cooperating with your committee in all matters that I have just pointed out in finding ways to fulfill the objective of Astana and achieve greater unity of purpose and action in facing emerging transnational threats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now we have a discussion. First one is Mr. Ashim Bayev of Kazakhstan. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые члены комитета, я рад приветствовать вас в рамках зимнего заседания парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ Вене. В своем выступлении хотел бы остановиться на следующих моментах. В 2010 году главы государств и правительств приняли историческую Астанинскую декларацию, которая поставила ряд стратегических, как минимум в среднесрочной перспективе, задач перед ОБСЕ и ее государственными участниками. Ключевой из них является построение евроатлантического и евразийского сообщества безопасности. Помимо этой стратегической цели, последующим председательством Литвы, Ирландии и Украины – было поручено выработать конкретный план действий на основе наработок казахстанского председательства. К сожалению, к данному моменту такой план не был разработан, так же, как и не был осуществлен обзор выполнения Астанинской декларации. В военно-политическом измерении в Астанинской декларации признается, что в сегодняшнем сложном и взаимозависимом мире мы должны добиться большего единства целей и действий для противостояния современным транснациональным угрозам, о которой говорили сегодня докладчики, таким как терроризм, организованная преступность, нелегальная миграция, незаконный оборот наркотиков, торговля людьми и другие. Все эти вопросы не теряют своей актуальности и должны оставаться в фокусе деятельности ОБСЕ. Считаем, что взаимодействие с Афганистаном должно усиливать свою значимость и оставаться в повестке Дня Организации в связи с передачей всей ответственности за ситуацию в стране на правительство ИРА, а также за планированным выводом войск Международных сил содействия безопасности к 2014 году. Разделяя позицию партнеров о необходимости принятия срочных и конкретных мер по содействию восстановлению Афганистана, считаем целесообразным, продолжить налаживание многостороннего механизма взаимодействия ОБСЕ, СУОН и другими региональными объединениями по урегулированию афганского вопроса. В частности, нам необходимо подумать, какую нишу ОБСЕ может занять в реализации региональной программы ООН по поддержке усилий по борьбе с наркотиками в Афганистане и соседних странах на 2011-2014 годы. Одним из важных шагов 
организации в противодействии транснациональным угрозам считаем создание в структуре секретариата ОБСЕ соответствующего департамента, о чем говорил предыдущий докладчик. Казахстан выражает надежду, что не нашедший консенсус на СМИТ ОБСЕ в Вильнюсе в декабре 2011 года проекты в сфере невоенных аспектов первого измерения будут все же реализованы. Астанинский саммит подтвердил, что режимы контроля над обычными вооружениями и укрепление доверия и безопасности остаются основными инструментами обеспечения стабильности, предсказуемости и транспарентности военной области. В этой связи было поручено обновить и модернизировать Венский документ 1999 года переговоров по мерам укрепления доверия и безопасности. Отрадно, что 30 ноября 2011 года под председательством Казахстана в форуме по сотрудничеству в области безопасности ОБСЕ было принято решение о новой модернизированной редакции этого документа. В своей новой редакции он носит название «Венский документ 2011 года». В него включены 9 решений, принятых форумом по сотрудничеству в области безопасности. И два из этих решений имеют серьезное политическое значение. Это обновление, обновленная преамбула документа и положение о регулярной модернизации документа. Издание Венского документа 2000 года стало minutes, политическим событием 2011 года для всей организации. Читаем, что успех казахстанского председательства в форуме по сотрудничеству в области безопасности был основан на заложенном предыдущими председательствами солидном фундаменте. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Next one is Mr. Wim Korteherven from Netherlands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few remarks and questions on behalf of my party, the Party for Freedom from the Netherlands. These remarks and questions relate to the presentations of both Ambassador Ildem and Ms. Alec Knight. No new conflicts have emerged in the OSCE region. At least that is what Mrs. Alec Knight claimed in her contribution. If only that was true. Indeed, no hot conflicts have emerged in the OSCE region recently. But the Cold War is being waged by Turkey against Cyprus and Israel as we speak. This is a new conflict involving natural resources in the eastern part of the Mediterranean basin. Turkey is claiming exploitation rights where other states own these natural resources. And Turkey is denying other states these exploitation rights, while these very states are entitled to that exploration under international law. Turkey is threatening Cyprus and Israel with its naval power. Turkey is even threatening the European Union, where it concerns the upcoming Cypriotic chairmanship of the European Union. This Turkey's policy of military intimidation and political brinkmanship is extremely dangerous. A simple mistake could ignite this Cold War into a hot conflict. I have raised this issue, this pressing issue, at the Dubrovnik session last year. But unfortunately, it is not on the agenda today. Why, I ask, is this volatile and dangerous situation being ignored at this meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe? I would appreciate it to get a straight answer to this question. And I call upon you again to assume your responsibility and to add this conflict to the agenda of the next meeting of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next one is Pauline Meurs from Netherlands also. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to the point of view presented by Mr. Koftenhofer from the Netherlands is not shared by the other members of the Dutch delegation. And I want to stress that we respect the different perspectives that are presented in this session, but want to stress also that the allegations towards the Turkish government are absolutely not supported by the other members of the delegation. We welcome the efforts of Ambassador Toskam Ildem to foster dialogue between member states and really support the priorities set for 2012. Thank you. So we have a gentleman from Turkey. I don't have your name. Would you please read your name if you have the floor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Shevki Kulkuloğlu from the delegation of Turkey. Uh, we have just listened, I suppose, a personal statement which is totally contrary to the spirit of understanding and cooperation that should prevail at the 
OSC Parliament Assembly. I don't think this speech deserves any response in our side and content. In any case, I suppose it may reflect a marginal point of view of the Dutch society, which cannot be attributed to the, neither the Dutch society nor the Dutch delegation of on OSIPA. So the Netherlands, which is a strong friend and a strong ally of Turkey. I make a strong plea to the Mr. President and Chair of the meetings of the committees not allow the unusual suspects to poison the atmosphere of this respective body. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have no further command, uh, comments, so I give the floor again to Ambassador uh, Ildem to comment to the comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I thought that uh, my uh, the, the fact that I was invited to this August body was uh, in my capacity as the chair of the security committee. And I was advocating the need for a good interaction between the legislative and executive branches. I have listened carefully to the distinguished representative uh, from the Netherlands. One thing he should know that uh, I served for four years as Turkish ambassador to the Netherlands. And uh, I have uh, also held very good dialogue with his leader. Uh, his leader uh, at that time uh, was uh, representing uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, a minority view, but still I took the initiative to reach out to him. Now, uh, this statement uh, was responded uh, with the counterparts from the Turkish legislative branch. But one thing I have to highlight is that uh, we need to instill uh, good understanding and cooperation among all of the countries uh, who are participating states of this organization. And first, we need to create a good spirit. And I don't think that this statement was fitting to such an environment. And uh, I uh, will make a strong plea that this should not be the uh, procedure to be followed by any of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now that concludes uh, point number five of our agenda. We continue with point number six, discussion on the fight against terrorism and crime. We are ready to start the panel discussion. I would ask the keynote speakers to limit their presentation at a maximum of 10 minutes. Less is better. As I have a look to the, to the clock, it says 4.30 now. We have time only till, uh, till 6 p.m. and we have a broad range of discussion afterwards. So I hand over the floor to Mauro Miedico. Is that the correct pronunciation? Uh, Chief of the Specialized Terrorism Prevention, Terrorism Prevention Branch, United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime. You have the floor. Excellencies, uh, honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime to be uh, represented here uh, today. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words, uh, given the time constraints, uh, on uh, how we see uh, countries can be effective in preventing and combating uh, terrorism. Uh, I have uh, some uh, slides which I will only use partially, given the time constraints, but I wanted to uh, stress uh, on one side the work the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime does uh, to support countries in achieving a rule of law based uh, criminal justice response to terrorism uh, and on another side to stress the um, enormous cooperation and effective partnership uh, our office has with the Organization of Security and Cooperation Europe and in particular the Anti-Terrorism Unit. Uh, we have received from all of you, from your countries, a strong mandate in the UN bodies 
uh, based on a number of resolutions that have asked our office to uh, help your countries, and in particular your parliaments, to strengthen the legal regime against terrorism. Uh, this poses a number of uh, strong challenges. But the UN bodies, and in particular the Security Council and the General Assembly, have given a clear path uh, on, on how we can work collaboratively and effectively to prevent terrorism. And one of the key points is precisely to start um, depoliticizing the issue of terrorism. And this will be my first message to your honorable uh, members of parliament. And have rather a technical approach based on a number of conventions and protocols that all of our countries have developed, that all of our countries have agreed upon, and that um, uh, we will need to not only ratify, but make sure that they, have Im they are implemented in our legislation. Uh, the key, as we see it, for a legal response to terrorism is an harmonization of our legal framework, and this relies a lot on the work you can do in your own parliaments. Um, we have also assisted, as the UNODC office, a number of countries in the last years, around 168 countries have uh, been um, benefited uh, from our technical assistance. And in 86 countries, we have developed uh, legislation together with national parliaments on counterterrorism or related uh, issues. Uh, there are a number of international obligations that all of our countries have assumed uh, that emanate from 16 conventions and protocols that exist, but also from a number of Security Council resolutions that are adopted under Chapter 7 of the, Security, of the Charter of the UN, and therefore they are mandatory. They need, and we have all agreed that we will respect this Security Council resolution. And they focus on the strong need to adopt national measures, both in terms of legislation and in terms of operational measures. Uh, they, of course, need to be considered while defining counterterrorism national strategies, in particular by your honorable parliaments. Uh, this will rely on ratification of the conventions and protocols, on enhancing effective domestic legislation based on the international parameters, on adopting measures for interinstitutional co coordination, and of course, ensuring that this approach is a rule of law based approach uh, uh, in conformity with international and national standards on human rights, humanitarian, and uh, 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 um, uh, human rights international law. But we need also to go a step further. Being effective on counterterrorism needs also to address issues related on how we can prevent terrorist attacks before they are committed, committed. And one key aspect in our view is also to ensure that we have a legislative frame in place that can allow for a criminal justice preventive strategy. This of course requires an effective criminal justice, requires strict respect for the rule of law of human rights, but requires also that we discuss about issues related to how to be effective and ensure that certain criminalization, certain offenses are criminalized in our legislation, uh, both in terms of preventive, such as participation to terrorist organization, incitement to terrorism, recruitment of terrorism, uh, directing terrorist uh, organizational cells, terrorist financing, but also that we have the adequate procedura, procedural uh, and operational uh, framework in place. Um, we need to stress the uh, need for specialized investigative techniques, uh, and they need to be uh, adequate to the complexity of the threat we are facing. Uh, this means also that we need to uh, collectively discuss how to be effective if we need to conduct an investigation or uh, wiretap conversation over VoIP 
or if you need, we need to use a, uh, a, some Akers investigation or a Trojan virus uh, to ensure that certain terrorist conversations over the Internet are adequately prevented, reprimanded, and more important, used for preventive strategies from our law enforcement and prosecution to intervene to dismantle terrorist plots before they are committed. Uh, and uh, this implies a, an enormous need also to reinforce international cooperation on criminal matters. Uh, terrorism is a transnational threat. And too often we are discussing about national sovereignty and we are uh, preventing an effective response to terrorism by uh, issues that frankly should not never be taken into consideration when we deal about extradition or mutual legal assistance. And uh, mechanisms to foster international cooperation, such as uh, those created in Europe with Eurojust, with the European arrest warrant, with any other valuable focal points or network of focal points created in many other regions of the world, need to be considered in particular when uh, developing new uh, legislation or new uh, legal uh, framework in uh, all of our countries. Of course, we have been uh, quite effective in producing a number of tools and strategies to support and assist parliaments, to support and assist national institutions all over the world with a number of even legislative manuals, legislative databases, uh, uh, legislative guides, uh, uh, and other related issues that we use uh, every day in our close partnership with national parliaments uh, and national institutions all over the world. But there is also a strong, strong need for capacity building. We need, once we adopt the legal framework, we need to go much further than that in ensuring that our national institutions have the capacities to implement and prevent, uh, to implement the legislation and prevent terrorism. We have therefore de dedicated a lot of efforts in creating a number of technical assistance tools, even innovative such as an online training platform or a comprehensive training curriculum that we develop together with national judiciary institutions, magistrate schools, uh, law academies, law enforcement academies, prosecutors, schools, to make sure that our criminal justice officers have also the capacity and the knowledge to address uh, very complex issues, uh, in particular to respond to evolving needs uh, uh, that uh, are particularly uh, uh, important in a number of areas, uh, in particular in the complexity of investigation and prosecution of terrorist cases, but also in ensuring uh, a, a preventive strategy uh, to combat the use or the abuse of internet for terrorist purposes, uh, to prevent chemical, biological, uh, nuclear uh, uh, acts of terrorism, to uh, be effective uh, to contract specialized mechanisms used to finance uh, terrorism uh, and uh, very other uh, aspects related to the policy development to make also sure that we give a voice to the victims of terrorism and that we, do, we avoid a double victimization which will only uh, stress on the on the results of a terrorist attack. We have been very operational all over the world in a number of projects and by placing our officers uh, work daily closely with national institutions in, uh, in uh, all over the world, but in Afghanistan in particular, in Pakistan, in Nigeria, to respond to the recent attacks uh, also to the UN uh, compound uh, in Abuja, uh, in Yemen, in the entire Horn of Africa, to address issues related also to piracy and maritime terrorism. Uh, in uh, Central Asia, in a strong partnership with, with uh, the OSCE. Uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, with even a strengthened uh, focus in some countries, such as uh, an important program we have, uh, we are kicking off now with Serbia and with other countries uh, in the region, in all the Latin America and the Caribbean region, uh, in the MENA region after the spring with a, an enormous need for, uh, expressed by the local governments to my office to support in 
the development of new legislation and in the capacity building uh, of uh, these countries uh, and uh, a key area also where uh, countries have required our office to intervene is the Sahel Band region uh, with uh, a key aspect related to uh, the uh, strong uh, links among drug trafficking, organized crime and counter uh, terrorism. We have also been very effective in South Asia, in Southeast uh, Asia, in particular Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, and uh, in, of course, uh, as many as 164 countries all over the world. I would like then to finish to say that while uh, it's extremely important for us to ensure strong partnership, and I have to reiterate that the partnership in particular with the uh, anti-terrorism unit of, CES, of the OSCE, it's uh, a model of efficiency and effectiveness and is used as a model by many other regional organizations. I want also to uh, stress uh, two main points. One, while you have to consider the development of national uh, uh, policies against terrorism, uh, please devote particular attention to three key areas. The strengthening of the legal framework the capacity building and the interinstitutional cooperation. Too often our institutions work in a total separate and compartmentalized way and we need to promote such interinstitutional cooperation in all manner. And secondly, as I wanted to say, uh, in our opinion, uh, the first and key factor to prevent terrorism is certainly also through the criminal justice system and through a rule of law based response to it. Of course, this is not enough. We need to broaden the vision. Uh, the global counterterrorism strategy adopted by the UN uh, puts a lot of emphasis on the uh, con conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. We need to address the root causes. We need to be much more uh, uh, effective in our approach, but also the response through the criminal justice system, it's in our opinion key, and it's key for the second factor, which is it permits and allows to address the issues of the links related to counterterrorism, uh, organized crime, uh, corruption, and uh, 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 other related criminal activities. Ten years ago, this was still a controversial issue, but in our direct dialogue with member states in this big symposium we celebrated last year in, here in Vienna in our headquarters, it has become evident that links are permanent today and we need also to address such links about organized crime, uh, terrorism and drug traffickers in an integrated manner and our office stands ready to support all of your countries. Finally, I would like to conclude by saying that the most important point is to make sure that we ensure a rule of law based approach. The balance between the security of rights on one side and the right, the right to security on the, on the other side is not only necessary, but it's the only way to be effective against terrorism. It's a difficult balance, but once we found it, we can certainly be sure that our approach to combat terrorism can be effective and appropriate. And I finish here. I've leaving it at two ten minutes. Thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you very much, Mauro. You had eight seconds left, so you were quite precise. Thank you very much. Um, now it is to Manuel Marion, Senior Program Officer from OSC Transnational Threats, Action Against Terrorism Unit. It's your floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, on behalf of the TNT Action Against Terrorism Unit, I thank the organizers of this meeting for offering of this unique opportunity to present and to discuss with members of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly about the scourge of terrorism. We would like that when finishing today's discussion, you are more aware of three issues. First, 
that all OSCE executive structures can and should continue contributing to the OSCE overall efforts against terrorism. Second, that in countering terrorism, as in other fields, the OSCE executive structures are following the mandates received in permanent council and ministerial council decisions. We are empowered, but at the same time limited by those mandates and by the resources allocated to it. Third, is that our add value lies in the OSCE cross-dimensionality and in the capability to create political awareness, being also a practical forum for exchanging experiences among policymakers and practitioners from Vancouver to Vladivostok. The participating states have agreed to fight terrorism from different angles in the framework of the UN Security Council resolutions and the Universal Counterterrorist Conventions and other instruments. Moreover, the participating states have committed to a proactive implementation of those instruments. Several, if not many, ministerial and permanent council decisions support that terrorism has been and continues to be high in the OSCE agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight the usefulness of reviewing from time to time the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy adopted in 2006. This is a good parameter to see how the OSCE could go further in its action against terrorism. The counterterrorism activities of the OSCE executive structures can be grouped into five strategic directions. From those directions you have on the screen, I would like to highlight that in countering terrorism, it is of paramount importance to anticipate the next move of terrorist preparedness. In this respect, it is important that this organization is able to identify emerging terrorist threats in order to participate in states being able to respond to address them before they happen. We believe that the newly created Department of Transnational Threats in the OSCE Secretariat will contribute not only to reinforce coordination among the Strategic Police Matters Unit, Borders Unit, and the Action Against Terrorism Unit, but it may also offer new and more complete perspectives and initiatives. The TNT Department and within the Action Against Terrorism Unit could be considered the heart that fosters counterterrorism among OSCE executive structures. But as you know, fighting terrorism is a complex issue that must be, must be faced in unison from various units, from various angles. The UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy is an important document that groups in its four pillars the measures the participating states should take into account when defining their counterterrorism strategies. In the OSCE, these measures are translated by its decision-making bodies in mandates to be implemented by its executive structures in the political, military, the economic, and the human dimensions. That's why we can state that OSCE deals with counterterrorism in a comprehensive manner. And thanks to OSCE presences in field operations, our counterterrorism action can be taken in its three dimensions to the final user of the adopted tools, their host countries. In this respect, I have to commend the role of field operations in the lengthening of the OSC action against terrorism. Those who are familiar with the Latin language in law will recognize why I call this informally, this is like iter criminis. Terrorism is a complex phenomenon, but excellencies, it's mainly a crime and a serious one. And the OSCE addresses that phenomenon from the moment that one person creates in their mind the idea to commit a crime till the offense is committed and further. We address the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. The reasons why a person may be motivated to join a terrorist group. The OSCE is also contributing to the global efforts to counter in the financing of terrorism since any criminal group needs money to carry out their criminal activities. 
you can find OSC activities that contribute to hinder terrorists' access to false documents, weapons and explosives. Last but not least, the OSC contributes to the creation of a universal jurisdiction of terror on terrorism cases. And in case of a terrorist offence is finally committed, to the creation of an OSC area free of safe heavens. Prevention of terrorism is a key element in the OSCE. It is important for all to understand how violent extremism and radicalization are generated and the process that leads to terrorism. Only a better understanding will help in hampering the spread of radicalization. OSCE executive structures have started recently a program on violent extremism and radicalization, which includes activities at the central and field operations level. In cooperation with other international organizations like the International Monetary Fund, the UNODC and the World Bank, the OSCE is fostering cooperation in criminal matters related to terrorist financing. We are facilitating the exchange of experiences and information and we contribute to the setting up of the legal and institutional mechanisms and tools to better hamper terrorist access to funds and values to carry out their activities. At this point, it is important to highlight the work of the various OSCE structures addressing different aspects of terrorist logistics, focusing in the prevention aspects of fighting terrorism again. One example is the conference this year in May, which has been organized by the OSCE in cooperation with our colleagues at the UNODC on how to improve the control of explosive substances, including its precursors and the cooperation in the investigation and prosecution of explosive-related terrorism cases. This will help participating states in a better implementation of their international commitments related to terrorist bombings. It is also in the scope of the OSCE the activities contributing to the implementation by the participating states of the UN Security Res Resolution 1540 and the conventions related to nuclear material. False documents are a key element for criminals, and particularly for those terrorists who need to cross the borders to carry out their activities. The OEC also had activities in this, in this uh, field. Proactive measures to prevent and to combat terrorism are complemented by activities oriented to the prevention, to the protection of essential elements that guarantee normal life in our societies. One example of this is the production of a manual on good practices in the protection of non-nuclear critical energy infrastructures. This manual will be ready next year. Excellencies, it is widely known that terrorists use more and more the internet for radicalization, recruiting, training, and organizing their attacks. The OSCE provides with training for law enforcement officers in investigative techniques and organizes series of online expert roundtables to reinvigorate and further stimulate information exchange on the latest trends, debates, and responses related to the terrorist use of the Internet. But sometimes all the measures and activities to prevent terrorism are not enough, and unfortunately terrorist attacks continue to affect seriously our societies. It is imperative to be ready to cooperate effectively in the investigation and rapid prosecution of the criminals. And the universal anti-terrorist instruments provide the legal framework to avoid the existence of safe havens for terrorists. Criminalizing the acts defining, defined in those conventions and adapting the penal codes and the codes of criminal procedures is the first step in the implementation of the international instruments. Today, I am happy to tell you that we have an objective indicator of success of this activity, since in the OSCE, the actual rate of ratification of the first 12 universal instruments against terrorism is very high. More than 92% of those instruments have been ratified by the participating states in the last eight years. In this respect, I have to congratulate the parliamentarians of OSCE participating states for their active and key role in this process. But don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, members of parliaments, that ratification is only the first step. The subsequent amendments to the laws and the effective misappointment 
of the relevant structures, institutions, and mechanisms is a must that guarantees effectiveness and readiness against terrorism. But an important element that has to be present throughout all the criminal process, and this is the respect of rule of law and human rights, and especially those of the victims. Finally, Excellencies, I conclude my presentation with the main ideas I would like to convey to you. First, all OSC executive structures contribute to the fines against terrorism to the extent they are allowed by, I repeat, but also limited by their allocated budgets by our decision-making bodies in the permanent council and ministerial decisions. Second, the OSCE, with its cross-dimensional counter-terrorist activities, constitutes a unique and original platform to create awareness and to exchange information, good practices and experiences. Finally, I would like to finish without I, will, I would like to finish this presentation without thanking all governments of participating states for their political support to counter terrorist activities. But political support is not enough. Most of our activities are implemented with extra budgetary contributions from some participating states. I encourage all of you to convey to your capitals that we need you to continue contributing financially to our activities, allowing us to strengthen them. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Manuel. The next one is Mr. Murat Yildiz, Police Affairs Officer, Training Advisor, OSC Transnational Threats. It's your floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Honorable members of the Parliament, His Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very privileged, uh, privileged and honored today to address you at the General Committee on Political Affairs and Security. Mindful of the limited time and advice from the Chair, I'll be very brief today in talking to you about the role of the policing in defeating terrorism and serious organized crime as well as the OSCE's approach to support the police agencies of participating states in performing their important tasks. All too often, we are reminded that terrorism continues to inflict pain and suffering on people's lives all over the world. Almost no month goes by without an act of terrorism taking place somewhere in the world indiscriminately affecting innocent people who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Countering this scourge of his interest of all nations and the issues on the agenda of the OSCE, in addition to other major international organizations such as UN. We, the OSCE, have been playing an important role. The fight against terrorism involves three dimensions of the OSCE and its structure as a whole, including its institutions. The role of policing in defe defeating terrorism in today's globalized world, not only are there important parallels in the structure and development of organized crime and terrorist organizations, but their actual organizations increasingly intersect. The interface between organized crime and terrorist groups has of course existed for some time and concerns such matters as use of same smuggling routes terrorist groups themselves becoming involved in organized crime for the purposes of fundraising or entering the drug trade to raise money to pay for armaments and explosives. As a conflict method, terrorism has survived and evolved through several millennia to flourish in the modern information age. It takes many forms and uses ever more sophisticated and deadly organizational techniques and operational methods and it continues to adapt to meet the challenges of emerging forms of conflict and exploit developments in the technology. Effective policing is essential in defeating the transnational organized crime and defending our states and democratic institutions in the global war against terrorism. Law enforcement agencies in general, and police in particular, have been playing and will continue to play a vital role in fight against terrorism. 
The police is the institution that is responsible for taking proactive measures in prevention matters, investigating and dismantling terrorist groups. In addition, patrol officers usually are the ones to be the first responders to the terrorist actions and their initial responses, evacuations, rescue and control of the scenes lead to the additional lives being saved. In both respects, prevention and investigation, there are two main complementary tools that the police might use. Intelligence-led policing and community policing. In the first case, when there's a system defining the police to gather information and it's adequately reported, analyzed and disseminated. It could help to unveil terrorist activities. In the second, the cooperation with citizens, NGOs and civil society can offer a substantial contribution, not only as sharing information tool, but also very helpful in identifying evolutions and trends within community policing. Lack of success in addressing terrorism by only applying traditional ways of policing led the countries and practitioners to seek alternative approach to the problem, such as using community policing. Certain less privileged segments of the society, and in particular low-income areas, minority groups, have become especially vulnerable to and affected by crime and disorder. It has become increasingly accepted among the practitioners, academics, and policymakers in the OSU participating states that a shift in philosophy of the police work is needed from exclusive law enforcement approach to one that also focuses on problem solving and service delivery. In view of the debt, many agencies of OSC participating states apply locally tailored community policing concept within day-to-day -day policing. That has been reflected in the OSCE ministerial and the permanent council decisions throughout the year. Therefore, the OSCE, through its field operations as well as through its secretariat, promotes community policing as one of the key components of police reform programs that are implemented by a number of OSCE field operations. The Strategic Police Matters Unit that, that is now part of the Transnational Department over the years developed a number of guides and best practices which promotes the police-public partnership and constantly working on how to draw community policing to address specific issues such as police and minority relations. The chair of the Security Committee, Ambassador Ildem, and other presenters have mentioned today that with the adoption of a decision in Vilnius, now we have a TNT department which brings together the units that have been operating individually in the past I'm very pleased to inform you today that the, the synergy that is expected out of the TNT department has already exist. Now, the department, together with the old segments, have been developing a guidebook which is about preventing terrorism and countering violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism. The purpose of the publication is to provide advice. This is one of the key contributions that our officers have been doing, primarily to the policymakers, police authorities, and community-based civil society organizations. Your Excellencies, dear parliamentarians, international cooperation among law enforcement agencies is another important tool in defeating terrorism that OSC promotes and supports regional and international cooperation among police services across the OSC area. When I was preparing this presentation, I thought it is appropriate to bring forward the challenges to the parliamentarians so that collectively we might find some solutions that is against uh, challenges and roadblocks against the international police cooperation. One of the challenges that we, we face is that the police organizations prefer to work unilaterally without cooperating with foreign police force. The second challenge, or a roadblock if you like, most police cooperation efforts are limited in the international scope and initiated on the basis of a specific need. Rather than relying on formal membership in a broad multilateral organizations, police prefer to work out arrangements pragmatically with one another on the basis of specific needs. Whenever police engage in international cooperation, this is the third roadblock, if you like, through an organization with relatively extensive membership. The form under which cooperation takes place is collaborative and does not involve the formation of supranational body. 
Instead, exchange and in, uh, communications among police organizations of different nations takes place through central headquarters, personal meetings, technologically advanced systems of information exchange. In order to overcome those roadblocks and challenges against international enforcement cooperation, countries should introduce necessary legal framework and provide the law enforcement agencies with adequate resources. Active participation and cooperation among police agencies is a must, as my colleagues said before me, to defend our countries against international crime and terrorism. Your Excellencies, dear parliamentarians, some of the difficulties or challenges of the international police cooperation are beyond the scope of the police to resolve. Lack of cooperation, lack of political will and legal foundations, as well as reluctance to allocate resources and reluctance to participate in cooperative agreement are all challenges must be faced. We all recognize that the globalization is a package of deal and challenges where the opportunities also abound. But for us in the security business, a key implication is that greater interdependence means that what affects the security and well-being of one country can also affect many others. Enhancing law enforcement cooperation is therefore not only an indispensable strategy to combat transnational organized crime and prevent terrorist attacks, but it also contributes to disrupting the innermost functioning of the crime networks and terrorist organizations. His Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear parliamentarians, in concluding, I hope that our meeting and discussion today will contribute to organizations' important role in supporting the states to defend our democratic institutions. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Yildiz. That, that was almost 10 minutes sharp. Okay, we finally come to Mr. Malisevich, Cyber Security Officer, OCE Secretariat. And you don't have to exceed more than, let's say, seven minutes. I'll try, I'll try. I might need eight. Excellencies, parliamentarians, dear colleagues and friends, thank you for inviting me to this panel, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today about cybersecurity. Some of you might wonder why I am here today. Isn't this panel supposed to be about the fight against terrorism and crime? When my 10 or 8 minutes are up, I hope to have sufficiently answered this and other questions that you may have had about cybersecurity um, and its place in today's discussions. Now, frequently briefings like this start with the presenter outlining some outrageously large numbers to illustrate how much money cyber criminals have stolen or how much money companies have lost or how much time and money were expended to deal with damage used, uh, caused by cyber evildoers in general. I will not do this. Why? Because any number you hear or read, regardless of how outrageously large it is, is very likely an understatement. It is very likely that much more cybercrime still remains unreported than reported, and that in itself makes it extremely difficult to conduct scientific research into the issue. So rather than look at some figures, what I would like to do is provide you with some context so that you can draw your own conclusions. Because I would argue, and this is one of the important messages that I would like, to take, like you to take away from this briefing, is that threats emanating from cyberspace are not overhyped. On the contrary, they are still underestimated. So how big is the threat? I'm not alone in believing that presently there are two types of targets for cyber attacks. Those who know that they've already been attacked and those who don't know it yet. To be quite frank, the only entities that don't have to fear a cyber attack are those who don't have anything worth stealing or anything worth attacking. Look at some of the private sector victims, Sony, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and you see these are no small fish. These are heavy hitters. And I would argue that these heavyweight private sector companies, or at least many of them, have arguably better cybersecurity in place than probably many countries in the world. So when speaking about threats emanating from cyberspace, what exactly are we talking about? I would like to distinguish among several categories. First, we have what is usually referred to as cybercrime, i.e. criminal acts conducted on or via cyberspace for financial gain, financial gain being the operative word. While exact figures are hard to come by, general agreement exists that economic damage caused by cybercrime is already astronomical and rising. Secondly, we would look at terrorist use of the Internet, whether it be for propaganda purposes, radicalization, recruitment, fundraising, for conducting cyber attacks, for example, on critical information infrastructure. 
Now, as countries grow ever more dependent on cyberspace, I think it is prudent to expect that cyber attacks will increasingly become attractive for terrorist groups. Thirdly, we would look at the interaction of states in cyberspace, which would lead us to issues of cyber war or cyber espionage. And here, we would be particularly concerned about escalation of conflict begun in cyberspace spilling over into the real world. Let me also mention another category, so-called hacktivism, tampering with cyberspace for political purposes, which is more difficult to classify, and groups such as Anonymous would fall into this category. And dealing with all these issues um, is what cybersecurity should ideally do. Now, however, one crucial bit of information. While the motivations, of course, differ, the methods employed by the actors in the different categories are, to a large degree, very similar. Often they are the same, which is why it is counterproductive to think too strictly in terms of categories such as cybercrime, cyberterrorism, or cyber whatever. The key point is the bad guys learn from each other, and at times they work together. Now, once a method or an attack vector is out in the open, it cannot be contained. Once the genie is out of the bottle, it cannot be placed back inside. For example, you may have heard of the Stuxnet worm some time ago, which was designed to disrupt a particular command and control component manufactured by Siemens. Now, Stuxnet is a pretty sophisticated piece of malware, to be sure. However, with information about Stuxnet in the open, it did not take long for others to recreate their own versions or cyber weapons inspired by it. And I remember one case in the United States last May, where, um, last year, where two guys were able to create something similar in sophistication to Stuxnet in their garage and on their laptops. Somehow these people always have garages and laptops. Um, they had initially wanted to showcase their findings at a computer security conference in Dallas, but were then convinced by the Department of Homeland Security to instead first show their results with Siemens so that they could first figure out a way to deal with the weapon they had created. Now combine this with the fact that Societies all across the globe are becoming ever more increasingly dependent on cyber infrastructures running smoothly in the background, and you have a threat level that is continuously increasing. There are those who say that a terrorist attack on, for example, the Internet is unlikely because terrorists themselves depend on it so much. To me, this is like saying terrorists would not attack airplanes because they depend on them for long-distance travel. But what exactly is the problem in terms of cybersecurity? I can only skim the surface in today's briefing, but in short, anonymity concerns are at the heart of most cybersecurity concerns. And you may have heard this elsewhere referred to as the attribution dilemma. And anonymity concerns have, of course, both a technical and a political dimension, but in short, as long as the good guys cannot locate with certainty, or at least beyond reasonable doubt, the origin or the origins of a cyber attack, the bad guys do not just have an advantage, they have a decisive advantage. Anonymity online prevents attribution, and without reliable attribution, cyber attacks remain without negative consequence for the aggressor. They get away with it. And the ever-growing numbers of cyber incidents points to the fact that cyber evildoers, whatever their motivation, are fully aware of this. Let me now explain why the OSCE is in a good position to make a meaningful contribution to tackle this threat. Enhancing cybersecurity is, of course, a cross-dimensional topic and endeavor at the OSCE, and as previous speakers have pointed out for a number of years already, the organization's Action Against Terrorism Unit and its Strategic Police Matters Unit have focused on awareness-raising and capacity-building activities in their related fields and have promoted a comprehensive approach to cybersecurity. And, of course, there's relevant work also being done by the representative of freedom of the media and by ODIR. Throughout 2011, OSC participating states intensified efforts to elaborate on a potential future and more active role of the OSC in the area of cybersecurity, complementing international efforts already underway. And in this respect, the 2011 OSC Lithuanian Chairmanship in Office initiated a high-level conference on the issue. One outcome was that delegations voiced their support to look into the possibility of harnessing OSC exper expertise in the area of confidence building measures and to apply it to cyberspace as part of, as part of enhancing interstate transparency, predictability, stability, and reducing the risk of misperception, escalation, and conflict, and as a means to complement efforts inter alia at the UN level. Now, many participating states also spoke in favor of building on the outcomes of the conference. Also. Sorry. Many participating states also spoke in favor of building on the outcomes of the conference at the, at the Vilnius Ministerial Council, 
Now, unfortunately, as you all know, despite intense discussions, the participating states could not agree on the final text of a pertinent draft ministerial decision. However, as Ambassador Ildem mentioned, um, it was decided to, within the Security Committee of the Permanent Council, continue discussions on the topic in 2012, aimed at the potential adoption of a decision here at the Permanent Council. Deliberations are ongoing. But overall, 2012 still has the potential to be a good year for the OSC in this thematic area, as it has a chance to make an additional concrete contribution to international efforts aimed at enhancing cybersecurity. As we have also heard at the organizational level, a newly created transnational threats department established within the Secretariat, which, which among other entities encompasses the ATU and the SPMU, is tasked with coordinating OSC efforts related to cybersecurity. Now looking at the clock, I see that my time is running out. Um, so in closing, I would like to reiterate that threats emanating from cyberspace are not going away. On the contrary, as countries grow more and more and more dependent on cyber infrastructures, the threat will continue and continue and continue to grow. It is my belief that the international community can, in time, overcome the technical difficulties associated with threats emanating from cyberspace. Equally, if not more important, however, it is to create sufficient will to address the political dimension of the threat. And it is here where, where you, as parliamentarians, have a crucial role to play. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malisevich, for your very interesting presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for debate. We have 16 delegates on the list. Um, that means we now have to close the list, looking to the uh, clock. And this means we have to limit everybody to two, two minutes of speaking. Two minutes, not more. Otherwise, we'll exceed the time. We have to leave in about 45 minutes for our reception here, so please, two minutes. The first one is Mr. Girard Desprez from Belgium. Uh, oui, Monsieur le Président, uh, chers collègues, très vite en style télégraphique. Uh, J'ai beaucoup apprécié les, les quatre intervenants et je me réjouis de l'importance que prend la lutte contre les menaces transnationales, parce que je pense que c'est un élément important pour relancer la coopération entre tous les États membres de l'OSCE. En ce qui concerne la lutte contre le terrorisme, je suis d'accord avec tous les orateurs pour dire l'importance du cadre légal harmonisé, pour dire l'importance des mesures de prévention dans tous les domaines, y compris contrôle des explosifs, des armes, euh, des précurseurs. Mais il reste quand même quelque chose d'essentiel dans la lutte contre le terrorisme, c'est qu'in fine, c'est la police qui, qui fait le travail. Et la, la police, elle a besoin de collecter des informations, elle a besoin de traiter les informations, d'échanger les informations. Et je rejoins un des orateurs, l'échange d'informations entre les policiers est très difficile, parce que les policiers ne donnent des informations qu'à des gens auxquels ils ont confiance. Et ça passe très difficilement par des organisations transnationales. J'ai vérifié ça au niveau de l'Union européenne. Et donc je pense qu'une partie du rôle important de l'OSCE, c'est de faire en sorte que les responsables de la sécurité opérationnelle puissent se connaître et échanger des informations entre eux. Sinon, même dans, dans la lutte transnationale, ils ne communiqueront pas les informations. Deuxième élément, je pense que nous avons besoin aussi au niveau de l'OSCE de développer des instruments comme ceux qui existent au niveau de l'Union européenne, à savoir faciliter les procédures d'extradition, avoir un mécanisme euh, de, de type Eurojust et également un mécanisme de type mandat d'arrêt européen. Si on a des instruments de cet ordre-là, je pense qu'il y a la lutte contre le terrorisme pour avancer de manière opérationnelle euh, beaucoup mieux qu'elle ne le fait maintenant. Merci de votre attention. Thank you very much. The next one is Adamos from Cyprus. Thank you, Mr. President. I hope you can hear me here. Yeah. In looking uh, into how the international community has been dealing with terrorism, a first key point which has been at the core of the Cyprus anti-terrorist policy is compliance of anti-terrorist measures with international human rights law. Sadly, though, anti-terrorist action has often fallen short of political sense. Terrorists being unequivocally condemnable in all its forms, a second focal point is whether 
determination to deal with root causes nurturing terrorist acts has been analogous of the determination to find terrorism. A mere look at today's world needs no further elaboration. A third crucial point is the need to address the absence of legal consensus on terrorism, state terrorism in particular, in the sense of the systematic use or threat to use violence by governments in order to create a climate of fear and attain a particular political objective raises a critical question. This pertains to the criteria upon which the international community ought to intervene to uphold international law, even more so in cases where such threats are directed against a sovereign state and its people. The OSC, uh, through its substantial work in the fight against terrorism and organized crime, should ensure observance of its fundamental principles. The role of the, of the OSC PA is crucial to this end. The need for parliamentarians to keep a pace and renew their commitment to the fight against organized crime as stressed at the Palermo Fall Conference, which also applies to combating ter terrorism, is highly relevant still today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Now comes Canada, Frank Maholic. Fellow parliamentarians, thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Before I continue, I want to thank the speakers who have given us a very thorough overview of the OSCE's efforts to address this issue. I want to focus on a particular aspect, and that is organized crime. I believe that the activities about which we just heard go a long way to supporting the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. Its related protocols, the three UN Conventions on the Illicit Drugs, the UN Convention Against Corruption and the Financial Action Tax Force recommendations all play reinforcing roles in the fight against transnational organized crime. Canada is deeply engaged in this fight, which requires a coherent and coordinated international approach. To this end, Canada works with its partners to support the universal ratification and effective implementation of these conventions I just mentioned. We also provide considerable technical assistance and capacity building assistance through the Anti-Crime Capacity Building Program. In conclusion, it behooves us as parliamentarians in this forum to promote the protection of human rights and human security, good governance, democracy and the rule of law in the region. These commitments are central to not only supporting security and stability, but also to successfully combating organized crime. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank. Now La France, Michel Voisin. No, Monsieur le Président, je passe mon tour, ça laissera du temps aux autres. That's perfect. Thank you. Next one is uh, Mr. Gulov from Tajikistan. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, дамы и господа, позвольте прежде всего выразить искреннюю признательность и благодарность руководству парламента Австрии и парламентской ассамблеи ОБС за инициативу созыва зимной сессии за блестящую ее организацию, а также гостеприимствие радушие. Вам хорошо известно, что Таджикистан продолжает оставаться буфером и прочным заслоном на пути беспокоящейся всех нас наркоугрозой. Мы хотим видеть наших соседних стран экономически самостоятельными и нейтральными странами, свободными от подобных недуг, недугов. И выражаем удовлетворение по поводу усилий международного сообщества в нашем регионе, нацеленных по, на установление мира, стабильности и безопасности, к чему с самого начала призвал Таджикистан из высоких международных трибун. Мы хотим, чтобы в Центрально-Азиатском регионе, как и на всем земном шаре, царил мир, спокойствие и взаимопонимание. Республика Таджикистан поддерживает развитие в рамках парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ, 
цивилизационного диалога, который призван способствовать развитию телеранности и сохранению культурного разнообразия введения политического диалога. Еще одно ключевое направление – это сотрудничество стран, участвующих в социально-экономической сфере, создание высокоразвитой транспортной энергетической инфраструктуры. Как вам известно, в документе принципов регулирующих отношения между государствами членами парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ подчеркнута убежденность в том, что рациональный и справедливый мир, миропорядок должен базироваться на укреплении взаимного доверия и добрососедства, на установлении подлинно партнерских отношений. Однако в последнее время идут негативные тенденции, которые, на наш взгляд, осознанно, нап осознанно направлены на игрорирование основополагающих принципов, которыми государство члены парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ обязалось руководиться в своих отношениях. Думаю, что настало время обратить пристальное внимание на ситуацию в Центральной Азии и сказать об этом откровенно. Обстановка в регионе с точки зрения стабильности и безопасности сегодня далека от идеальной. При этом хотел бы обратить ваше внимание на сложное положение, в котором находится Республика Таджикистан. Okay, Средства товаров, транзита электроэнергии, транспортных средств, вызванного своей нравной политикой некоторых наших соседей, мы рассчитываем на то, что такая не Конструктивная политика, идущая в разрез в целях и принципами парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ, получит должную оценку и будут выработаны коллективные Please. меры по ее предотвращению в будущем. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо большое. Next one is Mrs. Muradova of Azerbaijan. Господин председатель, я благодарю всех докладчиков во главе с многоуважаемым господином послом за содержательное выступление. У меня вопрос конкретный к господину Мурату Елдузу, представителю секретариата ОБСЕ. Кстати, его выступление было достаточно интересным, и с этим я его поздравляю. Мой вопрос связан с деятельностью полиции в контексте миротворческих операций и постконфликтного восстановления. Опыт ОБСЕ, в частности полевых миссий, является достаточно успешным. Азербайджан рассматривает полицейский компонент как один из элементов миротворческих операций, способствующий налаживанию диалога между общинами, созданию атмосферы доверия и предсказуемости. В этой связи, как вы видите возможную роль ОБСЕ и его гражданского полицейского компонента в операциях по поддержанию мира, и постконфликтного восстановления. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much. The comments from the panel should come at the end of the of this list. Next one is Mauro Del Vecchio from Italy. Grazie, signor Presidente. Come abbiamo ascoltato dai relatori, molto, molte misure sono state adottate da numerosi paesi per contrastare il terrorismo e la criminalità. Ma il terrorismo è un fenomeno globale e come tale chiede risposte che non siano limitate soltanto ad un numero ancorché grande di nazioni. In questo senso credo che l'OSCE possa fare molto. Può propugnare intanto la condivisione e l'applicazione di quelle norme tra tutti i suoi Paesi e tra tutti i Paesi che guardano l'organizzazione come fonte di equilibrio. Può combattere poi la le degenerazioni di cui il terrorismo si avvale. Penso al narcotraffico, una piaga che, che garantisce finanziamenti elevatissimi al terrorismo stesso. Ed ancora può, anzi deve a mio parere, sostenere l'Organizzazione delle Nazioni Unite nello svolgimento di funzioni che non si limitino al monitoraggio e allo studio del terrorismo, ma si traducono in azioni di indirizzo e di coordinamento stringente nei confronti delle nazioni per la lotta al terrorismo e alla criminalità. Ed infine quello che ritengo l'obiettivo più importante. Tutti sappiamo che frequentemente le forme di terrorismo si annidano laddove popoli interi vivono in condizioni di disagio materiale e di grande squilibrio sociale. 
Ebbene, credo che se i paesi dell'OSCE, noi, sapremo riconoscere questo aspetto, sarà possibile operare insieme ed eliminare quelle condizioni di ingiustizia e di sofferenza che rappresentano spesso il contesto di sviluppo delle manifestazioni terroristiche. Mi rendo conto che sono obiettivi difficili da raggiungere, ma credo che l'OSCE sia una delle poche organizzazioni che possa concretamente perseguirli. Grazie. Thank you very much. Next one is Monsieur Jean-Paul Dupré of France. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Dans le cadre de nos discussions sur la lutte contre le terrorisme et le crime, nous débattons aussi de la cybersécurité. Or, ce sujet est très complexe. L'Internet peut être véhicule de propagande haineuse, de matériel susceptible d'atteindre la morale et la santé publique, ainsi que la sécurité des personnes et des États. Mais l'Internet constitue aujourd'hui un moyen exceptionnel et planétaire de diffusion de l'information et des opinions qu'exploitent très largement les mouvements d'opposition, les défenseurs des droits humains et les journalistes. Nous tous avons pu le constater et nous en réjouir tout au long du printemps arabe et aujourd'hui encore en Syrie. Je crois qu'il nous faut donc être très vigilants. Les groupes vulnérables doivent pouvoir être protégés. Je pense notamment aux enfants victimes de pédopornographie sur Internet. La propagande raciste, antisémite et xénophobe les appels à la haine doivent pouvoir être interdits. Les systèmes essentiels, télécommunications, bacs et autres, doivent pouvoir être mis à l'abri d'attaques extérieures. Mais si le brouillage, le filtrage abusif, l'identification des blogueurs sont le fait d'États ou passifs lourds en matière des droits de l'homme, ils sont aussi pratiqués par des régimes démocratiques sous couvert, dans ces derniers cas, de l'autorégulation des fournisseurs d'accès ou de la protection à la propriété intellectuelle. Dans les régimes démocratiques, ce sont l'ensemble des droits de l'homme qui sont garantis sans établir de hiérarchie entre les droits. Et les restrictions qui sont imposées à l'expression de ces droits sur Internet le sont en conformité avec les limitations prévues par le pacte international sur les droits civils et politiques et les règles de l'État de droit, notamment l'intervention d'un juge au terme d'une procédure transparente et équitable. Mais parce qu'Internet est devenu essentiel à nos sociétés, il nous faut être vigilants dans chacun de nos États sur la portée des limitations que nous acceptons au nom de l'hypersécurité et de la lutte contre la criminalité. La présidence irlandaise a indiqué que sa première priorité dans la dimension humaine porterait sur le respect des libertés fondamentales sur Internet. Je suggère donc que l'OSCE transcrive dans son espace le code d'éthique pour que la société de l'information rédigée par l'UNESCO. Merci. Thank you very much. Next one is Mr. Monsieur Dedonea from Belgium. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Trois remarques. Un, merci aux quatre excellents rapporteurs. Deux, en ce qui concerne la cybersécurité, euh, il est étonnant de constater que rien de consistant n'a pu être accouché par la ministérielle de Vilnius alors que notre Assemblée avait voté à l'unanimité une résolution sur l'approche globale de l'OSCE pour promouvoir la, la cybersécurité que j'avais introduit avec le soutien de 54 parlementaires originaires de 22 pays différents. Nous pouvons donc nous poser légitimement la question de savoir quelle est notre capacité réelle d'influencer le Conseil des ministres, même lorsque nous votons des textes dont la pertinence et l'actualité tombent sous le sens et ne font, euh, font l'objet d'aucune controverse en notre sein. Troisième remarque, cela concerne la, la lutte contre la drogue et le terrorisme euh, au départ de l'Afghanistan. Je pense que l'on ne parviendra pas à résoudre les problèmes de l'Afghanistan si on ne résout pas le problème de la production de la drogue dans une grande partie du pays. Et je pense que la seule solution pour euh, euh, éradiquer la production de la drogue de ce pays n'est pas tant de détruire les champs des paysans qui ne font que les jeter dans les bras des, des talibans, mais plutôt d'imaginer un mécanisme économique de désintéressement et d'indemnisation des paysans qui renonceraient à la culture du pavot au profit d'autres cultures. Et je pense que la nouvelle direction de l'OSCE, qui s'intéresse aux menaces transnationales, devrait commanditer ou commissionner une étude 
sur, les, sur la nature possible d'un tel mécanisme économique et sur sa faisabilité euh, pratique. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Next one is Giuseppe Caforio from Italy. Sì, grazie Presidente. Colleghi, per affrontare seriamente e concretamente la questione della sicurezza cibernetica occorre non solo studiare l'argomento con più approcci, ad esempio giuridico normativo, informatico, socio-antropologico, ma soprattutto a vari livelli coinvolgendo più attori. La resilienza dagli attacchi strategici, infatti, non può e non deve essere di esclusiva competenza delle autorità di sicurezza dei singoli Stati, ma deve coinvolgere tutti, attori istituzionali e non soggetti pubblici come aziende private, singoli Stati come unioni regionali, macro-regionali e organizzazioni internazionali. Lo spazio cibernetico non conosce confini e quindi anche la guerra ai pirati del web non deve conoscere barriere nazionali e geografiche. L'attuale mancanza di intese e accordi internazionali, infatti, agevola e garantisce una certa incolumità a questi criminali del web. A determinare questa situazione di confusione e mancanza di incisività contribuisce l'incapacità dei vari Stati di concordare una strategia di difesa comune. Il dibattito purtroppo non si concentra sul come affrontare gli attacchi, ma anche sull'individuazione dell'attore tenuto a disciplinare le modalità di reazione e difesa. Non solo. Mentre alcuni Stati hanno seriamente intavolato un dialogo e messo a punto una strategia di difesa, altri Paesi, magari meno evoluti, continuano a rappresentare un paradiso lasciando i criminali informatici agire indisturbati. Manca inoltre una definizione universale dei termini attacco cibernetico e crimine cibernetico. Parte dalla responsabilità di questa lacuna risiede nella diversa concezione che nei vari angoli del mondo si ha della libertà di navigazione. Per i Paesi occidentali, infatti, la libertà di accesso e di espressione sul web rappresenta ormai un diritto fondamentale cui non si ha intenzione di porre alcun freno, un argine. Dall'altra parte, invece, abbiamo Paesi che limitano l'accesso considerandolo una minaccia per la sicurezza nazionale. Colleghi, questi sono alcuni dei numerosissimi problemi che il tema della sicurezza cibernetica ci pone. Sono lieto che in questa eh, sessione ci si occupi di questo tema perché è giunta l'ora, come ho affermato poc'anzi, che se ne parli a tutti i livelli. Grazie. Thank you very much. Next one, Mrs. Yol Doshova from Kyrgyzstan. Спасибо, господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги. Я хотела бы обратить ваше внимание на три вопроса. Конечно, мы говорим насчет безопасности, но, к сожалению, например, в Средней Азии вопрос между странами Кыргызстан, Узбекистан, Казахстан, Таджикистан не решены границы, вопрос границы. Вот, пожалуйста который может привести к определенному конфликту. Я надеюсь, что, уважаемый председатель, к этому вопросу области относится, будет очень серьезно, может быть, будет содействовать решению этих вопросов, почему более 20 лет, как мы получили независимость, к сожалению, это очень такой важный вопрос, до сих пор не решен. Второй вопрос. Вы знаете, вот, к сожалению, которую мы имеем огромное богатство, это вода. В Кыргызстане имеет действительно и Таджикстан. Но, к сожалению, наше государство не обеспечивало свой народ и государство энергетической безопасностью. Но, однако, Мировые сообщества к этому вопросу хотят обратить внимание. 12 марта 2019 года в городе Марсель пройдет шестой водный форум. Такой же вот, большая конференция прошла в мае 2011 года в Ташкенте, в Узбекистане, где, к сожалению, мнение делегации Таджикистана и Кыргызстана не были услышаны. Я почему об этом говорю? Потому что, когда вырабатываешь электроэнергию и эту же воду используешь на сельскохозяйстве, я думаю, что они друг другу абсолютно не мешают. Однако, 
Таджикистан, Кыргызстан, Средняя Азия являются они не такими большими государствами, может оказаться соседи, может прижать со всех сторон. Поэтому по этому вопросу тоже я надеюсь, что э, будет э, в данном форуме э, учтены э, наши просьбы, просьба двух государств о том, что данный вопрос был решен и энергетические, и водные вопросы параллельно. И третий вопрос, это очень важный вопрос. Я хочу выразить обуся, ну, большую э, благодарность. Буквально 30 секунд. Даже в нашем парламенте добавляет 30-20 секунд. Прошу вас, уважаемый председатель. И э, наркотрафик. Вот говорим про наркотика, да? К сожалению, город Ош, южная столица нашей республики, республика Кыргызстан, это и есть Самый главный наркотрафик в мире. Сейчас в обусе по этому вопросу очень хорошо обращает внимание. Но я тут хотела бы вас попросить, уважаемый председатель, данный вопрос вынести э, следующему э, нашему заседанию о том, что более эффективно, чтобы э, дал какой-нибудь результат. Понимаете, вроде обращ... обусе очень хорошо внимание обратила, но нет результата. Поэтому я надеюсь, что данный вам, данному вопросу будет особое отношение. И э, наркотрафик, который проходит через город Ош, я надеюсь, будет обсуждено э, в следующем заседании. Спасибо. Grazie signor Presidente, il volto che il terrorismo ha mostrato negli ultimi 10-15 anni è stato soprattutto quello del terrorismo suicida, per cui credo che le difficoltà che ha incontrato la comunità internazionale nella definizione di terrorismo risalgono alle difficoltà che abbiamo avuto sul terrorismo suicida. Sul terrorismo suicida proprio l'OSCE in un'assemblea di Washington del 2005 approvò un supplementary item che a me sembra ancora attuale, soprattutto là dove si chiedeva alla comunità internazionale di considerare il terrorismo suicida crimine contro l'umanità e in questo senso invitare tutti gli Stati membri a non prescrivere i reati per cui i capi di Stato, capi di governo o capi politici di gruppi che disponessero o agevolassero l'esecuzione di atti che rientrano nella tematica del terrorismo suicida. Sotto questo profilo credo che l'OSCE abbia nei propri archivi argomenti di grande attualità a cui richiamare la comunità internazionale. Grazie. Thank you, Mr. Lopez of Spain. Grazie, signor Presidente. Antes de nada, io quiero felicitar a los señores Miedico, Marion, Gildiz y Malisevic por sus importantes eh, y solventes informes. Los cuatro han destacado la importancia de la prevención en la lucha tanto contra el terrorismo como contra el crimen organizado. Eh, por la dinámica de su día a día, está claro que las sociedades modernas son muy vulnerables. Eh, los atentado, atentados como el del 11 de septiembre en Nueva York o el 11 de marzo en Madrid son imparables una vez que entran en su fase de ejecución. Eh, por eso es tan importante lo que han planteado, ¿no? la, la, la prevención. Mm, solamente eh, abortándoles antes de que inicie su fase de ejecución eh, se pueden evitar este tipo de, de atentados, para lo que es imprescindible la obtención de información, el análisis de esa información y la elaboración de inteligencia. Y para ello es fundamental la colaboración policial internacional. Y para que eso se produzca, es fundamental que cuenten con el mayor apoyo de las instituciones políticas para que den las máximas facilidades a esa colaboración y, el, y que den el mayor apoyo a sus fuerzas eh, de seguridad y policiales. Por eso, señor presidente, si me lo permite, muy brevemente, simplemente para pedir a los miembros de esta 
Asamblea que insten a sus respectivos poderes ejecutivos, a sus respectivos gobiernos, llevar a cabo acciones contundentes en esa dirección que faciliten la colaboración policial internacional. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you. Now Portugal, Mr. Silva. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, Messieurs les rapporteurs. En ce qui concerne la lutte contre le terrorisme, je voudrais souligner tout d'abord que nous sommes confrontés avec un changement des méthodologies et des stratégies terroristes. En effet, ces méthodologies et ces stratégies sont de plus en plus cybernétiques avec l'utilisation d'Internet, même si les résultats sont également destructifs. Il faut donc envisager le besoin d'un urgent changement des stratégies et des méthodologies de combat contre le terrorisme. Je voudrais bien en souligner trois. Première, harmonisation. Il faut engager de plus en, euh, de, le plus grand nombre de pays, de gouvernements et d'agents sociaux en créant des synergies. Deuxième, anticipation. Il faut agir avec intelligence et de façon préventive. C'est à plus bon marché pour les budgets publics et plus épargnants de vie humaine. Troisième, stratégie holistique. Monsieur Emmanuel Marion nous a parlé d'une dimension humaine dans la stratégie contre le terrorisme, c'est-à-dire de la démocratisation de l'éducation des droits de l'homme, en bref, d'un développement solidaire. En effet, plusieurs fois, le terrorisme euh, naît de la marginalisation et du désespoir. Il faut développer cette dimension humaine, donc. Et il faut vraiment s'interroger si nous, dans l'Organisation pour la Sécurité et Coopération Europe, faisons vraiment ce qu'il faut faire. Merci de votre attention. Thank you, Koskun Koros, the lens. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Ambassador Ildem how he respond on my resolution, and I welcome that, and I follow that, but especially this issue on the radicalization which could lead to terrorism is an important one. I also welcome the other excellent speakers because I was really de delighted how they put their input, although the issue is not delighted at all. And thirdly, our rapporteur, she challenged us, I congratulate her, to think about this theme of international security and how we can uh, uh, form that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I missed uh, some elements, and I will, uh, with my humble um, uh, attitude, I will react on that. First of all, I think that counterterrorism should start at home, because I'm now reading the book about the so-called 21st hijacker, Mr. Zacharias. You are well familiar with this dossier. And if you read the whole life of this man, it is horrible, but it should start at home. Secondly, the awareness of parents on the Internet. What kids today are doing on the Internet, say they even it's going so far that they attack the Pentagon in the States, but do all terrible things, and parents don't know what is happening. Thirdly, what I also miss is the local approach. I fully agree with the experts that international ratification of law, etc., that is needed. But the local approach, uh, let's say normal policeman, is the first one who discovers the networks, and the networks are changing, as my colleagues said. It is not the traditional terrorist organizations. It's also the cells. Fourthly, I'm we're deeply concerned about the weapons in the Middle East now discussing the Arab Springs, what happened there. So I should uh, want an answer for that. And finally, the easy way that persons could get uh, for chemical stuff. If you see how easy it is to buy that and to sell that, that could lead to dangerous situations. Thank you. Thank you. Emin Onen from Turkey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Terrorism is a leading threat against international peace, security, and stability. We are committed to combating terrorism in all its forms, without distinction. We recognize the importance of a determined, consistent, and unequivocal stand against this scourge. We have drawn strategically important lessons from our decades long experience in fighting terrorism in various forms. We have come to realize that relying solely on security measures do not produce sustainable solutions to the threat of terrorism. Any counterterrorism campaign is incomplete if not complemented by the human rights dimension. Hence, our counterterrorism strategy is based on a multidimensional approach with due respect for human rights and the rule of law. International cooperation is critical for tackling terrorism. We actively support international and regional efforts in that direction. The UN remains to be the main platform for promoting a united stance against terrorism. Turkey is a party to the major UN conventions and protocols on terrorism. As a terrorist organization, and by its very nature, the PKK, wish to undermine democratic process within Turkey. Therefore, its natural reflex in the face of effective democratic process is to resort to violence. At a, such an important juncture in, in our fight against the PKK, we expect the support of our partners and allies in counter-terrorism. The PKK has clearly evolved into a threat against Europe by means of its organizational structure and illegal activities, notably terrorism financing. In fact, reports of Europol and the EU counter-terrorism coordinators confirm this. It's critical to raise awareness among European countries in this respect. We should work together to this end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Mr. Zafarian from Armenia. Спасибо, господин председатель. Я вопрос, который я хотел озвучить, уже прозвучал. Я снимаю свое выступление. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Now I pass over the chair, the floor, I mean, to uh, the gentleman here on the panel to answer question and give comments. We start with Ambassador Ildem, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think we have uh, a very full discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, I picked a couple of very important uh, points raised by the distinguished members of Parliament. Uh, the distinguished Belgium uh, uh, representative uh, mentioned the importance of uh, cooperation among uh, police uh, uh, centers, police uh, authorities. It is very essential, and I think exchange of information in countering terrorism and organized crime is crucial. And I hope within the OSC we could be able to reach the standards of a certain group of countries like uh, the European Union, uh, like uh, EU arrest warrants and other methodology. Uh, another uh, point was raised by uh, uh, MP from France, uh, and uh, he mentioned uh, the uh, possibilities offered by Internet. Uh, in the cyberspace, uh, we are uh, seeing many important developments uh, which are considered to be opportunities. But I also agree with him that uh, we should also take into account the challenges aspect of the question. Uh, child pornography, uh, the spread of propaganda material in support of terrorism, xenophobia, racism, uh, is something that we, we should be vigilant about. Uh, the uh, Belgium uh, uh, representative uh, talked about uh, his fr frustration that in Vilnius uh, the ministers uh, could not agree on a uh, cyber decision. Uh, well, we share this uh, frustration and uh, hope that uh, in a short uh, span of time uh, we could be able to uh, resolve the matter by uh, adopting a decision to set up a working group uh, so that uh, uh, certain measures could be uh, adopted uh, soon. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, drug issue, uh, 
I think Afghanistan and our cooperation and uh, strengthened engagement with this country is essential uh, to create also the necessary circumstances uh, to counter uh, the, the activities in that field. And uh, within the OSCE, we are working, we are going to work on specific second uh, generation projects uh, to deal with alternative uh, uh, agricultural production within Afghanistan and uh, the capacity building in that sense uh, so that it can be substitute to uh, uh, poppy uh, cultivation. Uh, and one uh, final uh, uh, point uh, was uh, uh, raised uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the remarks of uh, Josh Goncheris from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, I uh, concur with his views that uh, uh, we need to focus on our efforts at home. Yes, everything starts at home, encountering terrorism. But we need to strengthen the ways to cooperate uh, at the international level. And it is in response to uh, the uh, delegate from Turkey. I think international cooperation is essential. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess Mr. Yildiz now gets the floor because uh, somebody asked you a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for giving me the privilege to speak before my colleagues. And, um, and I would like to thank sincerely for the old reflections that the parliamentarians have put forward about the international police cooperation and various areas of serious organized crimes, namely the drug trafficking and terrorism. Very briefly, Mr. Chair, if you allow me just one minute just to reflect overall. I guess uh, the reflections by the members of the parliamentarians um, from various countries of the OSC testifies that the organization's actions as well as a strategy to promote and foster international cooperation is the right one. So we are very happy to hear that the, the lawmakers agree with the way that the Secretariat has been taking this issue. Please be assured that when we work along with the countries, along with the organizations, we have a structures like the Security Committee, whose chair is with us, with the Ambassador. The Secretariats, the departments are accountable to those structures and assuring that the taxpayers' money is not wasted by duplicating the efforts that the other organizations have been doing. Now, more specifically for the question of Azerbaijan, I thank you very much for this question, which is a very lively top topic here in the, our agenda in the margins of... Um, discussions and negotiations of the OSC strategic police framework, uh, we discussed uh, the potential role of the OSC. Dear parliamentarians, as you know, uh, the OSC as an organization has engaged in building, confidence building activities through its field operations over the decade. And more importantly, uh, we engaged in uh, those activities with a country specific and mission specific mandate given by the decision-making bodies of the OSCE that are namely the uh, Permanent Council and the Ministerial Council. So um, when we study the past activities of our organizations through our field operations in the policing, we see that our police-related activities have focused on police reform and development, police training and education, creating community policing and multi-ethnic policing. So our experts, police experts who have been deployed to the field operations, gave advice and assistance to their counterparts. In some missions, though, they had a role of monitoring. Uh, for example, in one particular working station, the return of the policing into the post-conflict societies. As our Secretary General has said recently at the last Security Committee meeting, when we study the OSCE's police-related activities, it is rather difficult to distinguish whether the activities that we have been doing can be categorized as peacekeeping police mission. When we say the peacekeeping police mission, I guess it immediately draws a picture in our minds, which is a blue helmet UN mission. I should say that unfortunately, the, uh, our activities throughout the decade does not indicate that this organization has a specific experience um, in providing police peacekeeping missions as such uh, in, in our field of prison. I guess that answers the questions from the, from the Azerbaijani delegation. With that, I thank you very much, Mr. Chair, again.
Thank you. Does any one of the other gentlemen wishes to comment? Yes, please, Mauro. Signor Presidente, mi permetta parlare in italiano per una volta che sono all'OSCE, uso la mia lingua, che è lingua ufficiale qui e non dalle, alle Nazioni Unite. Vorrei ritornare sul punto della cooperazione internazionale, che per me è un elemento essenziale. Io ho cercato di trasmettere eh, l'idea che dobbiamo cominciare a rafforzare il marco normativo, a rafforzare le capacità interne di ogni Paese e la cooperazione interistituzionale. Ma questo non è sufficiente se non è appoggiato da un meccanismo o da meccanismi forti di cooperazione tra Paesi. Il mio ufficio ha prodotto più di 30 pubblicazioni che dimostrano chiaramente e che sono usati nella nostra attività di assistenza tecnica, di capacity building, e che si basano su analisi di casi di terrorismo, su indagini, su eh, casi concreti avvenuti in tutto il mondo. E, e invito per esempio a leggere il nostro Digest of Terrorist Cases, eh, che è su internet come tutte le altre 30 pubblicazioni nelle sei, sei lingue ufficiali, e che dimostra come la ramificazione di organizzazioni terroriste e di gruppi di crimine organizzato sia un elemento evidente. Un caso su tutti. Indagini hanno dimostrato che le FARC colombiane vendevano cocaina all'ETA spagnola, che a sua volta rivendeva questa cocaina alla camorra napoletana in cambio di armi che la camorra aveva preso da gruppi balcani. È evidente che i gruppi di crimine organizzato e che i gruppi terroristici non hanno frontiere. E vorrei qui usare, per chiudere, un aneddoto del caro amico Piero Grasso, il procuratore nazionale antimafia d'Italia. Il giorno del 1989 della caduta del muro di Berlino, alcune intercettazioni telefoniche di mafiosi a Palermo dimostravano che un capo mafia da Palermo chiamava un corrispettivo dell'organizzazione mafiosa a Berlino e gli diceva il giorno della caduta del muro di Berlino vai nell'est nell'est della Germania negli altri paesi e compra tutto e dall'altro lato il corrispondente gli diceva cosa devo comprare e l'ordine era compra hotel, ristoranti palazzi, edifici compra tutto, tra dieci anni varranno dieci volte più caro di quello che stiamo pagando i gruppi criminali, i gruppi terroristici non hanno frontiere e vanno molto al di là di quella che è la risposta dei gruppi di law enforcement, del prosecution o dei giudici. Dobbiamo cominciare a capire che se la risposta non è trasnazionale rispetto a queste minacce che sono trasnazionali, non saremo mai efficaci nella lotta contro questi. Grazie mille. Thank you, Do you wish to comment? Not necessarily. Okay, then we come to an end of uh, point number six of the agenda. No number seven, any other businesses? I see none of them. So we conclude number seven. L let me continue in German. It's a bit easier. Ich möchte mich bedanken. Einmal bei den Dolmetschern, die einen wunderbaren Job gemacht haben. Vielleicht geben wir ihnen einen guten Beifall. Ich möchte mich bedanken bei dem Büro der OSZEPA, insbesondere bei Tina Schön, ohne die jeder Vorsitzende und jeder Präsident hilflos ist. Vielen Dank für die gute Vorbereitung. Ich möchte Sie, I, I want to inform you, in uh, about 12 minutes, the buses will leave to the Parliament, to the reception, so don't be late, 6.15 p.m., Have a nice and interesting evening. I thank you very much for your cooperation in this remarkable event. See you tonight and see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.
quei cavi da capire no? Allora, amico, che ha sei posto?